Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Terra CRG, The Wickoff Group, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage Lending, Genova Burns. Additional support is made possible by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, AmTrust Title, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Connect One Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, Flushing Bank, Friedman, LLP, Hendler Real Estate Organization, Hersha Hospitality, HAP, Investment Developers, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, iFunding, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Pulsinelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Continuum Company, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, The Meringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Poland, Lithuania, Shanghai, New York City, textiles, pearls, Kew Gardens, Yeshiva, Yeshiva College, Georgetown Law, Wild Gottschall, Republican Jewish Coalition, American Friends of the Likud? Who's this individual? Who's the chairman of the real estate practice of Wild Gotcha? It's my friend Phil Rosen, my guest today. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. It's really a very interesting story about your father and your mother. Tell me the, the, the father's story because it's, so it's unique. Both my father and my mother, the fact that they survived and the fact that they were able to create what they created is just a miracle. So let's start on dad start and then we'll go dad. to mom. So dad grew up in a family in Warsaw, Poland. He had five siblings and um, his family was both Hasidic and Zionist, which is almost a contradiction in terms today, but back then it was totally understandable. He spent half his day every day in the Cheder which was the Jewish school, and then the other half of the day was in what's called the gymnasium, which was the secular school where he um, also was part of the Zionist club uh, called Beitar. That was my father's childhood. When he was around 22 years old, um, the Nazis had started bombing Warsaw, Poland, and my grandfather, who was a real visionary, said to my father and two of his younger brothers, all three of which, all three of whom were not married yet, told them that they have to leave and they have to run as fast and as far as possible because the Nazis are on their way. Um, he decided that he couldn't make the trip because at 46 years old, he felt he was too old to make the trip. Also, he had two other kids that were married with children and he felt they couldn't make it. And then the youngest was 12 years old and he felt that he wasn't able to make it either. Unfortunately, that decision ended up being tragic because all of them were killed in the Holocaust. 
My father and two of his brothers escaped. They started running through the forests. Um, one of them decided that the only place he could end up was Palestine. He wasn't going to take a second choice of anywhere else in the world. So he ran by himself and eventually made it to Palestine, but with stints in um, labor camps in the Siberia and then in Cyprus. My father and the other brother found out as they were running through the forest, they heard a crazy story about a Japanese consul general in Kovno, Lithuania, who was issuing visas for Jewish um, survivors, I guess, at the time, to go to Kobe, Japan. And my father said to his brother, we have to at least give it a shot. Let's make our way to Kovno and let's find out if it's true. They got there, they found that it was true. They waited online like everybody else. And they and anywhere between three and 6,000 others got visas to go to Japan and eventually were placed from Japan into the Japanese colony in Shanghai. And what's, what year did they arrive? So they arrived, we think, around 1940, and they stayed until 46. Now, 46. you told me that prior to that, your dad and your uncle were entrepreneurs. The watch story, tell that story. So, um, you know, as they're running through the forest, they really had no money with them, um, and they had to eat. They were starving, um, and um, they ended up in a train station um, which was controlled by the Russians and Russian soldiers were all around one end of the train station and at the other end my father saw a man selling watches out of his coat and my father said to my uncle let's go over to the watch salesman they walked over um, the watch salesman showed them his wares and my father said give me about 10 of the watches and uh, I just want to take a look at them in better light. Um, the watchman said, um, well, how do I know you're going to bring it back? And he said, I'm leaving my brother with you. I think that's enough security. He walked over to the other side to the Russian soldiers, and he sold them each of the watches for obviously a, um, a margin, and that margin was food for them for weeks. And that later on is when, you're, when your father is in Shanghai, he goes in to the textile business, and the, right. the, the company was called Paltex. Paltex. So Pal my father, his brother, and two other brothers called the Millrods um, started a uh, textile company in Shanghai. They bought, he bought wares from the um, Chinese, and uh, he sold them in the Jewish community. And at this time, the, the yeshiva is even there, the mirror yeshiva. I right. mean, these people were surviving and didn't have a great life, but they were surviving in, in, in Shanghai. Shanghai. It was now, surviving. Let's talk about mom, and then we'll get back to dad. So mom's family. My mother grew up in um, Frankfurt am Main in Germany. Um, she was the youngest of six kids. Um, and uh, when the war first started, actually even before the war started, when Hitler took power, um, my mother's oldest brother, who was 20 years older than she was, had left England for a job, had left Germany for a job in England um, as the distributor of Philips Lights. They didn't have Philips Lights, they only had GE in England at the time. My uncle became the distributor. He did very well. He came back to Germany when Hitler took power and he said to my grandfather, everybody's got to leave today. He said, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, today, because this man's a maniac and he's going to do what he said he's going to do, which is kill the entire Jewish race. Um, so my grandfather, obviously questioning him, eventually said, if you say it, that's fine. But what happens to all of our wares? What happens to our houses, the um, merchandise we have, money in the bank, my uncle said, leave everything behind because it'll be impossible to get it out and it'll take months if not years and we don't have we don't have that time he said leave it all behind i will provide for everybody in the family exactly what you have here i will provide for you in england and my grandfather said yes and my uncles all had families of their own 
also said yes, and everybody left. So they will survive. The entire family survived. So let's go from Shanghai to how your father comes to America. So my father came on one of the um, uh, one of the outbound planes um, and ships, and he took a ship and um, and he arrived on the shores of uh, New York. Um, the one thing that I didn't mention before about the Shanghai part was you also had to have an exit visa from Japan right, to another he, country. He got, you said from Curacao. He got from the, um, the consul general for Denmark, gave, um, gave him and, and others a, uh, a visa to Curacao. So when he boarded the boat to come to the United States, uh, he used that Curacao uh, visa as one of the means to get out. He also had to have a job, and um, a yeshiva in Baltimore sent a letter saying that he was uh, going to be a teacher. So he ended up uh, getting to New York and uh, didn't finish that Curacao part until 30 years later when my mother said, we'll go on vacation to Aruba, and my father said, we have to stop in Curacao because I still have the visa. <laughs> Now, your father comes here, settles on the Upper West Side, and subsequently goes into business with his brother, right? Yes, they started eventually. They, they did a textile stint, and then they worked for somebody else in the pearl business, and then, and then they started their own. It was called Irving and Henry Rosen Cultured Pearls. And then mom comes here, what, like 1955? 55. She came on a vacation, and uh, my mother and father each had first cousins who were married to each other and settled in New York and they matched them up and uh, it was weeks rather than years that they dated and uh, got married and um, I was uh, I was their first child. I was born August 1956. And at that time they were living in the Upper West Side? Upper West Side and when I was born they moved to Kew Gardens. So let's talk about growing up of young Phil, okay? You grew up in Kew Gardens originally, you went to Yeshiva, and then, um, then when did your parents move out to Great Neck? When I was six years old. Um, in fact, our last day in Kew Gardens happened to be the day that President Kennedy was shot. Because I remember we had no furniture left in the apartment. It was all in the moving trucks. And my mother was sitting watching TV, crying hysterically. And I couldn't understand why. Of course, I figured it out pretty quickly. So now you're in Great Neck, and you, you go to school over there at the North Shore Hebrew Academy, Hebrew Academy, which was small because at, Very that, small. at that time, Great Neck had a lot of secular Jews, but not really a number of religious there, Jews. Exactly. And, you, and your parents wanted you to become a traditional religious Jew exactly. over there. And w when you're growing up, isn't there the story when your father was a Zionist, as you said, and Menachem Begin. Tell the story about Menachem Begin. So Menachem Begin was one of his... Zionist leaders from all the way back in Poland. I remember I mentioned before that they were secular in their afternoons and their mornings they were uh, Hasidic. Um, one of his leaders was Menachem Begin and they stayed in touch. And uh, when Menachem Begin was in the opposition, um, he would meet with my father every year and my father would help him with uh, his primary effort or whatever it was that, uh, that he was allowed to do. He gave him assistance. And um, when I was 13 years old, um, um, before that I should say that uh, my father had us reading The Revolt, which is Menachem Begin's book about his life. Um, I think when I was eight years old, while my other friends were reading, you know, The Cat in the Hat, I was reading Menachem Begin's The Revolt. A little boring, but, uh, you know, years later, very interesting. So when I was 13 years old, my father woke me up on a Sunday and he said, we're going to the city and you're gonna get to meet Menachem Begin. We walked into his room at uh, one of the hotels, I think it was the Waldorf, and um, I was in awe because this was a person that had been become my hero throughout my childhood. And um, I met him and uh, my father and he spoke in, in a little bit in Yiddish, a little bit in Hebrew a little bit in English, I understood at least one of them. And um, at some point my father pulled out his checkbook 
and uh, wrote a check and I asked uh, my father if I could give to Mr. Begin money. and so he, Prime Minister, future Prime Minister Begin turned to my father and said, where does a kid who's 13 years old have money? And I said to my father, I said, I take a portion of my bar mitzvah money and give it to the Prime Minister, future Prime Minister. Now, isn't there a story later on? Yes, years later, um, I was on vacation with a friend in, uh, in Israel, and my father said to me, and Menachem Begin was the Prime Minister at that time, and my father said to me, go take a walk on Shabbos afternoon and go visit the Prime Minister. I said, Dad, come on. He's the Prime Minister. He has 32 security guards around him. I said, I'm not going to his house by myself on a Saturday afternoon without an appointment. My father said, I asked you to go, please go. And he hung up the phone. I always listened to my father and my mother my whole life, never questioning. I walked over on Saturday afternoon, knocked on the door. Security guard opened the door and he said uh, in Hebrew, who are you? And I said, please tell the prime minister that, and I used my father's name that he used in Poland, Itchik Rosen. Itchik Rosen's son is here. And he comes to the door, the Prime Minister. He reaches out and he said, you're the boy who gave me the money. I said, yes. He pulled me in. He took me into his uh, dining room. And in the dining room, he had a who's who of Israeli life. You know, a famous author, a famous artist, a famous general, a rabbi or two, just sitting around the table talking. And um, he said to everybody, he said, I just want to tell you that this is my friend's son from the United States. He said, um, I'd like you to speak in English, but if you can't, speak in really simple Hebrew so he can understand and be part of the conversation. It was one of the highlights of my life. So getting back to your life, after the first nine years, because... Uh, North Shore didn't go there. You went to MTS, which was part of Yeshiva College. MTA, yes. Um, yeah. Yeshiva College, Yeshiva University High School. Right, so Yeshiva University High School. And then you graduate high school, and at this time, you wanted to be closer to your parents, so you decided to go to Yeshiva College. Right, I wanted to stay in the New York area so I could come home on weekends without it being a hassle. Well, when was the time that you decided you wanted to be an attorney? Um, so... I was considering going into my father's business, which was a very successful cultured pearl and then diamond business. And I spent a summer working for my father sometime in college. I think it was my junior year or a portion of the summer. And um, my father realized that I was colorblind, like to the point where going into the business would have meant losing an enormous amount of money. And so he said to me, I think you should find something else to do. I always thought about law, but this made the decision absolute. Now, you, you graduating Yeshiva College, um, you decide to go to a Jesuit law school, go to Georgetown. Right. And, and you're there, and the first year between law school, you work for which firm? Chadbourne and Park. And uh, then you go back, and the second year, uh, you go to work for this boutique firm called Wild Gottschall. Relatively small. 180 lawyers, and, um, but a great reputation, um, and up and coming is how they described themselves back then. And I loved it. I thought the people were great. Um, I loved the practice that I was in, loved the environment, um, the clientele was terrific. And I said, you know what, this is where I think I'll come back to. But I um, applied for clerkships and I got one of the premier clerkships for the chief judge in the Southern District of New York um, for the year following my graduation from law school. And I did that. It was a great experience. And so then you come back after that, after the year, and you go to work for Wild Gottschall. I did, 1982. So 1982, and, you know, Wild Gottschall, you, you, were, you were a good kid because you were made partner within five years, right? Six years. Six years, I mean, which is early part in the track. And you work with the legendary Harvey Miller? I worked a lot with Harvey Miller. He was And Ira Milstein? I he was my mentor, Ira Milstein. One client was the, the legendary Saul Goldman. 
right? Uh, who, um, who? I'll tell you the shortened version of shortened the story. Shortened version. So Sal Goldman called me up. He was considered to be um, obviously one of the premier real estate people, but he was also considered to be a little tough. Um, and I'm being very mild in my description. Um, I had met him on the other side of a deal and I get a phone call one day and I really thought it was a crank call. And just to use his voice, he said, hey, this is Saul Goldman. I said, excuse me, which one of my friends is playing a practical joke? Eventually I figured out that it actually was him. And he asked me to help him with the, um, what was then the Gotham Hotel where he had ground leased the hotel to a Swiss developer and it wasn't working out. It was a year and a half later and the hotel wasn't done. He asked me to figure out some way to get the Swiss developer out, which we did. And then we eventually bought the hotel back from a group of German banks that had lent $150 million to this Swiss developer. Let's talk about uh, how you got involved so much with the three or four things that you're close to Republican Jewish uh, coalition. So I've been involved in with Israeli politicians since way back when I met Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, when he was here in New York as the um, deputy uh, ambassador to the UN and we became friendly and some of him and some of his other friends introduced me to other Israeli politicians so I was heavily involved in Israeli politics um, from a support point of view, not financial, but anything but. And then you were also involved with the founding of the American Friends of Likud. Right, and American Friends of Likud's role was to bring these Israeli politicians to the U.S. for speaking engagements, really just to um, put out there the Likud um, platform in the United States. But when you're working with the uh, Republican National Coalition, Jewish Coalition, you meet the legendary uh, Sheldon Adel. So uh, I started at the RJC, the Republican Jewish Coalition, um, maybe now about 14, 13, 14 years ago. Um, got very, very heavily involved in the Bush reelection campaign. And um, I was at the White House uh, nine times for dinner. Um, I thought President Bush was an astounding and outstanding leader. But you have to um, tell the story about Sheldon because yes. it goes circumvent with yes, regard to China. Back. So uh, Sheldon was somebody who I got very close to on the board and I remain close to, to today. Um, so at some point I'm sitting in a meeting uh, in Sheldon's office and um, with a lot of other people. In the middle of the meeting, Sheldon turns to me and says, Phil Rosen, where are you from? And I said, um, Sheldon, I'm from Long Island. He said, come on, not you, stupid. Where's your family from? I said, well, my father was from Warsaw, Poland. He said, and how did he get out? And I said, there was this man, this amazing Japanese man. As soon as I finished that sentence, he pulls out his iPhone he dials a number and he says, Bookie, one second. And he gives me the phone and he says, I think you should talk to the man. I think you should talk to the son of the man who saved your father. This is Bookie Sugihara. He's a friend of mine. And from that point on, Bookie Sugihara. We have Sugihara, a picture of Bookie and you. We do, we do. Because recently they dedicated a street in Israel, in, her, in Netanya, um, to. Mr. Sugihara, Chiuni Sugihara, and his son came and he called me up and he said, Phil, what are you doing next Tuesday? I said, well, I was going to be here in New York. He said, no, no, no. He said, I'm going with my wife to Israel. They're dedicating a street to my father. You have to be there and you have to speak. And I went and I spoke to about 3,000 people in an audience, many of whom were survivors and the children of survivors and the grandchildren of survivors from China. Now, another thing that you've been active besides through law and everything else is you've been involved with Yeshiva University. Yes. Uh, you've been on the board of Yeshiva University and Yeshiva College. Right. right. When, the, when the Yeshiva College board was first founded, I was one of the founding members of that board. Uh, recently, I've stepped up to become uh, on the board of trustees of Yeshiva University. And I'm totally, enormously dedicated to Yeshiva University. 
I give a lot of my time and a lot of my effort because I think it's the premier institution for Jewish uh, studies, but I also think that it is uh, the paradigm for modern orthodoxy in the United States and maybe around the world. Now, uh, with, with regard to that, let's talk about the, your children a little bit and their involvement with Yeshiva University and everything, okay. and your wife's involvement. So my wife went to Stern College, which is the girls' college from Yeshiva University, and um, one of my sons is a junior, uh, soon to be senior at Yeshiva University, and loving it, loving every so minute of it. Tell me the names of your wife and the kids, okay, because so we my, have pictures of all of them. My wife is Malki. We've been married 27 years, uh, 27 wonderful years. My oldest is Rachel, um, and she just finished the bar exam. Uh, she's starting work in October at a nice law firm. She's married to my dear son-in-law, who I love, Shai Pizer. Um, beautiful wedding. And then my next daughter is Miriam, who I adore. She just finished Barnard, and uh, she's working as a teacher, but she's also um, dabbling in the social media space. Um, number three is Isaac, who is, is in Yeshiva University. And Isaac worked this summer at a um, technology fund. And then Joseph, who is just graduated high school. For one year, he's going to be in Israel at Yeshiva. He's going to uh, NYU Stern. You're the chairman of the real estate practice uh, for yes. Wild Gotchel. And have How been since... Uh, I think 1997, so it's a long time. And how many people uh, um, are under the real estate? Nationally, we probably... It's real estate and gaming, right? It's real estate, hospitality and gaming, and infrastructure, all combined in one practice. Um, and we probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 to 50 people internationally. Now, you also have a home in Israel? You, you... I have a house in Israel that I go to whenever I, whenever I can. Um, it's uh, my dream come true, having a house in Jerusalem. We have a picture of you with the motorcycles. So one of the causes that I'm involved in in Israel is um, Hatzalah, which is the ambulance um, emergency service organization, private. And I've given them four, um, four different ambucycles, which are emergency service providers without the stretcher. They were able to maneuver through the streets, which is magnificent. They get there in record time. So for the, for the kid who, you know, grew up in Kew Gardens and um, Great Neck, fortunately, your father and his brother listened to Grandpa and went to Lithuania, China. Thank God. And over here. And thanks for being my guest today. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate it. A lot of fun.